today we are looking at a case from the second part of the 19th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. Lydia Danbury was born on Christmas Eve 1824 in the town of Burlington in New Jersey. But tragically, when she was just nine months old, her mother died. When her father married for the second time, she was sent to live with her uncle on his farm. She stayed there until she was 16, when she went to live with her brother in New Brunswick. Here she found work as a tailor and became a member of the local Methodist church. She was described as an attractive young lady with piercing blue eyes and gentlemen were always keen to make her acquaintance. It was while at church that Lydia first met Mr Edward Struck. He was a widower in his late thirties and the father of two children. He worked as a blacksmith. Despite the age difference, they married. They moved to New York, where in 1845, the Metropolitan Police Force was established, replacing the night watchman system that was now deemed inadequate to cope with such a rapidly expanding city. Edward was offered a position as a police officer. This now put him in a far better financial position and the family moved to 125th Street in Harlem. Over the next few years, Lydia gave birth to seven children, four girls and three boys. Sadly, the firstborn named Josephine died in infancy. It was not easy bringing up six children and things became more difficult when Edward lost his job in the police force and fell into a state of depression. He had been called to investigate an incident in a hotel ballroom, but he was slow in arriving, which had resulted in a New York detective being murdered. It was rumoured that Edward had feared for his own safety, so had not gone immediately to the hotel. An internal police investigation followed, which resulted in his dismissal. Edward's health then declined, and instead of trying to find another job to support his large family, he spent most of the time in bed. It was suggested that due to his condition, he should be placed in an institution. Lydia, however, was reluctant for her husband to leave the family home. But just a few weeks later, Mr. Edward Struck was dead. New York City had become a metropolis with a population of almost 1 million. And this had resulted in the increase of deaths attributed to diseases such as cholera, typhus, typhoid fever and dysentery. Typhus had become virtually epidemic in the very poor areas of the city. There were also outbreaks of smallpox and scarlet fever. The number of people that died from tuberculosis was increasing every year, especially in the city's crowded tenement buildings. So the death of a depressed middle-aged gentleman was not considered suspicious. Neither were the deaths of Mrs. Lydia Struck's three youngest children, six-year-old Martha Ann, four-year-old Edward, and one-year-old William, who all died very shortly after their father. Lydia now had three children living in the house, all of who could work and contribute to the household bills. Her eldest daughter, also named Lydia, was 18 and employed as a clerk in a dry goods store in Harlem. Her son named George was 14 and worked as a painter's apprentice. The youngest was now 12-year-old Ann Eliza. However, George too became ill with what the doctor described as painter's colic, which was actually caused by lead poisoning. Lead was usually added to paint as it increased durability and helped to surface maintain a fresh appearance. This was because lead was able to resist moisture that caused corrosion. A few days later, George died. In the winter of 1864, Mrs. Lydia Struck's youngest daughter, Anne Eliza, contracted a fever, so it became necessary for her older sister, also named Lydia, to give up her job as a clerk in the Harlem dry goods store to stay at home and look after her. However, despite the care from her sister, Anne Eliza died. Now out of the seven children born to Mrs. Lydia Struck, only her eldest, 18-year-old Lydia was still living. To help raise income for the house, she began to sew bonnets from home, but she too soon fell ill and died. There were those who rallied round Mrs. Struck, offering their condolences at her most terrible loss. Although the deaths were considered tragic, None of them raised any suspicion with the authorities. Even when her stepson, Mr. Cornelius Struck, raised the question that it was strange that all seven of the children his father had had with Mrs. Lydia Struck had died, and six within only a few short months. Yet she herself had shown no signs of any illness. The police department had promised to investigate this, but death was commonplace, and tuberculosis and typhoid were both widespread.
Mrs. Lydia Strzok was also an upstanding and dignified lady who would surely never have done anything to hurt anyone, especially not her children. After all, she worked in such an admirable position as a nurse for a local physician. Eventually, the authorities decided not to investigate the suspicions of Mr. Cornelius Strzok. Lydia next found work in a sewing machine shop and by chance, a customer named Mr. John Curtis learned about her nursing experience and asked if she would take the position as nurse to his elderly mother. This was a good opportunity for her as it meant that she would also be able to live in the elderly lady's elegant house in Stratford, Connecticut. But just eight months later, she accepted the offer of another position, working as a housekeeper for a wealthy widower named Mr. Dennis Hulbert. Soon after moving into Mr. Hulbert's residence, the lonely gentleman asked her to marry him. And of course, Lydia accepted. Although Lydia was now in her mid-40s, she was still considerably younger than her husband and was described as a fine-looking woman. It seemed to the people of Stratford, and indeed Fairfield County, that the new Mrs. Hulbert was a devoted and caring wife. Fourteen months later, however, Mr. Dennis Hulbert was dead. Lydia inherited his house, valued at around $20,000 and $10,000 in cash. In September 1870, Lydia married for a third time. Her new husband was a mechanic who had a very good reputation, named Mr. Horatio Nelson Sherman. However, he had recently found himself in very poor financial circumstances. He was the same age as Lydia, having been born on the 19th of February 1824. He was also a widower and the father of four children, 17-year-old Nelson, 15-year-old Ada, 4-year-old Nathaniel, and a baby, not yet a year old, called Frankie. Lydia moved into his house in the small town of Derby in Connecticut, which was about eight miles from New Haven. The children's grandmother also lived with them, as following the death of Mr. Sherman's first wife named Mary, she had stayed in order to take care of young Frankie. Shortly after assuming her place as the new Mrs. Sherman, baby Frankie became ill and died. This meant that there was no baby to care for and there would be no further need for the mother of Mr. Sherman's first wife to continue to live in the property. Mr. Sherman's daughter, Ada, was 15 years old and was considered a beautiful young lady who was most admired in the local area. Young gentlemen would always seek to make her acquaintance whenever she was out with her grandmother or at church. Ada, however, also became ill and died. Death had followed Mrs. Lydia Sherman. Two husbands, seven children, and two stepchildren had all died around her, but she was still considered the most benevolent of women. The loss of two of his children, which had happened so soon after the death of his first wife, had a profound effect on Mr. Horatio Sherman. He became extremely despondent and started to drink heavily. He stayed away for a number of days at a time before returning home very drunk and having spent all of the money that his wife had given him. This went on for a few months until Lydia persuaded him to seek help. He agreed to join the temperance movements that campaigned against the recreational use and sale of alcohol. He then remained sober for several weeks, but unfortunately, he eventually started to drink again, much to the annoyance of his wife. Following one of his nights of drinking, he became quite ill and died. A doctor named Dr. Beardsley was summoned to write the death certificates. However, he was concerned that the previously healthy gentleman had died so suddenly and so soon after two of his children had passed. He asked the deceased gentleman's wife, Mrs. Lydia Sherman, if she objected to an autopsy being conducted on the body. She replied that she did not. Dr. Beardsley then asked Professor George Frederick Baker of Yale University to analyse Mr. Horatio Sherman's organs. This took a couple of weeks, and the result of the examination found large quantities of arsenic present. The friends of Mr. Horatio Sherman insisted that the bodies of Frankie and Ada were exhumed, and autopsies performed. The authorities agreed, and the results found large quantities of arsenic in both. The authorities then decided to exhume the body of Lydia's second husband, Mr. Dennis Hurlbert. Soon after the death of her husband, Mrs. Lydia Sherman had travelled to New Brunswick to stay with relatives, where on the 7th of June 1871 she was arrested. She was then charged with murder and taken to New Haven to await trial. 
The trial began on the 16th of April 1872 and seemed to have caught the attention not only of the state of Connecticut, but the whole country. Journalists flocked to the courtroom in great numbers in the knowledge that the intrigued public were anxious to read what was happening in the case. Some headlines described Mrs. Sherman as the poison fiend, the arch murderess and a modern borger. But in court, Lydia appeared every inch the elegant lady. She was described as looking prim and proper, wearing a black alpaca dress, a black and white shawl, silk gloves and a straw hat with a thin black veil. Despite the fact that the autopsies had revealed that two of Mrs. Sherman's husbands and two of her stepchildren had probably died from arsenic poisoning. She was only put on trial for the murder of her third husband, Mr. Horatio Nelson Sherman. In court, she appeared calm, and when asked how she pleaded, she replied, not guilty. The trial lasted for eight days, during which time, some newspapers reported how ordinary the defendant looked, certainly not like how they believed. Anyone would have imagined a person who had been responsible for the deaths of two husbands and two stepchildren would have looked. She was by now 47 years old and appeared confident and some said almost cheerful behind her veil. The defence did not suggest that Mr Horatio Sherman had not died as a result of ingesting arsenic but argued that he either took it accidentally or took his own life following the tragic deaths of his first wife and two of his children. Lydia was adamant that she had not poisoned anyone and asked if she could take the stand in her own defence. Her counsel, however, would not permit her to do so. The case presented by the prosecution was not altogether conclusive, as although the autopsy had found large amounts of arsenic in the deceased gentleman's stomach, the evidence that his wife had given it to him was only circumstantial, and there was cause to consider an element of reasonable doubts. Due to this, when the jury returned, they found the defendant, Mrs Lydia Sherman, guilty of second-degree murder. Some newspapers were not so generous towards the jury, insisting they did not find Mrs Sherman guilty of first-degree murder, simply because they did not want to send a woman to the gallows. Mrs Lydia Sherman was later sentenced to serve a life term in the Weathersfield Prison in Connecticut. However, five years after being convicted, she escaped from prison. It was now June 1877. The way in which she escaped was quite remarkable. On several occasions, Mrs Sherman pretended to faint and made out that she was extremely poorly. She had obtained a white dress to replace her prison uniform and under the watch of what the prison authorities described as a careless matron, managed to walk out of her cell and out of the prison gates. She was met by her friends and travelled to Providence in the state of Rhode Island, which is one of the oldest cities in the United States. Her escape was reported extensively in the newspapers and she was re-arrested after she signed into a hotel, calling herself Mrs. Brown from Philadelphia. But then when talking to the owner's wife named Mrs. Sears, she told her that her name was Mrs. Moore. Mrs. Sears became suspicious and contacted the police. When she was first sentenced, with the aid of her jailer named Captain Weber, Lydia wrote a book titled The Poison Fiend, Life, Crimes and Conviction of Lydia Sherman. In this book, Lydia confessed to her crimes. However, she was barely able to read and write and had trouble remembering exact dates. Not only did she confess to the poisoning of her second husband, Mr. Dennis Hurlbert, and the two youngest children of her third husband, Mr. Horatio Sherman. She also confessed to poisoning her first husband, Mr. Edward Strzok, and six of her children, with the exception of her firstborn, Josephine, who had died in infancy in 1843. She also said that she did not intend to poison her third husband, Mr. Horatio Sherman. Although she did have arsenic present in the house, she thought that he may have accidentally ingested it, thinking it to be celeritus, which was a baking soda-like compound, which when mixed with cider, made it froth. It was somewhat ironic that the one death that she claimed was not her doing was the one that she was convicted for and received the punishment of a life sentence in prison. In her book, she also claimed that the idea of using arsenic to poison her first husband, Mr. Edward Strzok, was suggested to her by a police sergeant who lived in the adjacent building. He'd apparently told her that her husband was out of his mind and would never recover. He advised that it would be best if she got him out of the way. The police sergeant also told her where to buy the poison 
and how much to administer. Her book was first published in 1873 and became a bestseller. It was released again in 1878, which was the year that on the 16th of May, after a period of illness, Mrs. Lydia Sherman died. The exact number of people who died as a result of arsenic poisoning by the hands of Mrs. Sherman is unknown, but many believe it could have been more than 10. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.